good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you all to the fourth Breathe In Dialogue as a part of the Cleaner Air and Better Health Project, also known as the CABH Project. The Breathe In Dialogue series are a, a series of webinars with a view of generating a community of people with know-how on how indoor air, on indoor air quality issues, concerns, and solutions. The dialogues are held every month around four thematic themes, um, which is regulatory convergence, integrated design and technology, monitoring and management, and open awareness and communication. These dialogues are curated by us at Environmental Design Solutions, along with a knowledge partner, the Society for Indoor Environment, SIE. Today, we have leading experts and change makers representing various domains such as medical field, media, technology, and solutions, exchanging their journeys, experiences, and facts on indoor air pollution. You can look forward to an engaging discussion with our esteemed panelists and participate in interactive sessions. So let me begin with a little brief about the CABH project. It's a five-year project supported by the USA with the aim to strengthen air pollution mitigation and reduce exposure to air pollution in selected regions in India. The project is implemented by a consortium led by the CEW and includes environmental design solution, ASAR social impact advisors, vital strategies, and Enviro legal defense firm. We aim to achieve the project's objective to strengthen air pollution mitigation and reduce exposure to air pollution in India through consultative processes evidence-based and targeted approach. The consortium is working to scale solutions across the states in the country. We are piloting innovative models to tackle the emission and air pollution in different sectoral interventions. We are talking about forming an ecosystem that enables adoption of cleaner practices in multiple sectors and between various stakeholders to accelerate clean air goals. This will be done by creating a result-based, impact-oriented playbook to scale solutions and influence the clean air disclosure. All of this is based on a five-pillar solution map, which consists of enabling monitoring and regulatory reforms, using the data for decision-making, sectoral transition to clean energy through, through innovative solutions, empowering citizens through outreach and awareness, and finally, equipping institutions with relevant capacity for in, informed decision-making. The Cleaner Air and Better Health Project is built on the foundation of innovation, the synergy of integration, and the commitment to implement, implementation for a lasting impact. When we consider the impact we aim to achieve, we are targeting a nearly 50% uh, reduction in air quality improvement in the areas covered by the CABH through various interventions. It's about creating a legacy for cleaner air and better health by building solutions that scale and institutionalize best practices. We are ensuring a brighter future for all. I now invite my colleague Nidhi Gupta to set the context for today's dialogue. Also, please feel free to use the chat function to ask any question and give any comments. We will also have some interactive poll sessions um, uh, during the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dipanjali. And I welcome you all for the first of the Breathe In Dialogues of the year 2024. And this is the fourth dialogue of our series. The first dialogue, uh, the first three dialogues were technical, centered on topics like cleaner air for healthcare. And then we looked at what kind of metrics and standards are available for indoor air quality. And the third one was looking at uh, focusing on prioritizing pollutants and identifying which are the pollutants of concern in our homes and our workspaces. Today, we'll do it a little different. Uh, differently, we'll take a step back and look at what you and I can do in terms of making our spaces, our environments healthy for us and our loved ones. So uh, the, uh, our awareness on air pollution has you know, begun to emerge, especially now as 
uh, as the harmful effects of urbanization, industrializations are now becoming very visible. The air has become denser in many of our cities today. As per statistics, air pollution is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. And it's not only the outside air, right? It's also the household air pollution that is gaining that attention today. Considering that we are spending an increasing amount of time indoors makes indoor air quality very important. Studies have shown that there is a correlation between exposure to poor air quality, impacts on health, whether it be chronic, neurosensory, headaches, discomfort, etc. Studies are also showing that indoor air quality can be much worse than outside air. Now, as individuals, we are taking a lot of efforts to improve what we can do with what, what is available with us, right, for our indoor air quality, be it through cleaning um, uh, regularly or servicing our air conditioners, servicing um, our filters, adding air purifiers, opening our windows, allowing for light and air. And some of us are also looking at, uh, you know, installing indoor air quality monitors so that we can monitor how our air quality is. Um, I'd like to request you to participate in one of the polls that is coming up on your screens. Which actions do you normally take to improve the indoor air quality uh, at your homes? So many of us are doing taking many actions simultaneously, opening doors, and windows regularly servicing our air conditioners, ex using exhaust while, co uh, while cooking, um, as well as opening, uh, you, some of us are also using air purifiers. Okay, but how effective and reliable are some of these strategies and to what extent? You know, how do I know if I'm doing the right thing at the appropriate time and whether that action is actually materializing to have, have having in an improved indoor air quality. How often should I be changing my filters? Considering outside air is so bad, how effective is it for me to open these windows? Was air pollution really as bad as when we were growing up? Or is it just suddenly that because things have become visible and now you know indoor air quality is also a concern because we are locking ourselves inside? What role do plants play? All these and many more are some questions that we'd like to address today. So while there are being, while there are efforts being made, you know, to get the blue skies back in terms of regulations and standards, what efforts can we as individuals take to ensure that every breath taken indoors contributes to a healthier, happier, and a safer life for us is a thought that I'd like you to like to leave with you today. With, oh, with that, over to you, Dipanjali, to introduce our experts and the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. So today we have a diverse group of experts um, from medical field to journalism to technical solution providers. So starting with Barun, uh, Mr. Barun Agarwal is a serial entrepreneur with a versatile background and international experience spanning around 25 feet plus years in several continents. Currently, he heads uh, Breathe Easy Consultants, um, an indoor air quality solution provider, focusing not only on indoor air quality, but also energy conservation. He is a member of ASHRAE and is a founding member of IEQ Committee of ISHRAE. He's passionate about the social impact of outdoor air pollution and has co-founded an NGO, Care for Air, that creates awareness about air pollution and its health effects in India. Next up, we have Chetan, uh, who is a climate and air pollution journalist and consultant in climate communication strategies. He was associated with NDTV 24-7 for close to three decades. Chetan has led editor editorial coverage of air pollution and climate stories and have worked with several research groups and think tanks. He is a board member of the advocacy group Care for Air and advisory board member of AQLI, Energy Policy Institute of the University of Chicago, and consultant with Respire Living Sciences. 
Next, we have Dr. Nilima Gupta serving as the director, professor, and head of ENT department at University College of Medical Science and GDP Hospital in Delhi. She has special interest in allergic airway diseases. She is an ENT surgeon and has been focusing on research to understand the effects of air pollution on airway diseases. She has delivered talks on the role of environmental factors in nasal and sinus diseases. And we have uh, Sachin Panwar, who is the founder of Yoga Clean Air. He has introduced the concept of clean air bubble. Sachin supports development of innovative solutions to address air pollution and design proof of concept for air purifier companies. He is an active member of the Society for Indoor Environment. I now request Mr. Tanmay Tathagat, Director at EDS, to moderate this session with our experts. Thank you. Thank you, Deepanjali. Welcome, everyone. Now we have a, a maybe 45 minutes to an hour where we can answer or start answering some of the questions that uh, were raised by, uh, by our uh, previous session speakers, as well as questions that people have. So I would like uh, this session to be structured in a way that we have uh, an open discussion uh, and going in uh, in as much depth as required. And so I would request also for uh, all our participants to feel free to type in the Q&A box if they have any questions while we speak. And we would like to accommodate as many of them as possible. I also know that this is a mammoth task. I myself have had probably 100 questions, so we may uh, have to have uh, more follow-up sessions. But uh, let's start with uh, understanding the journeys of, uh, of some of the uh, problems that we see today and also some of how people have arrived at uh, uh, specific solutions, knowledge, and understanding. So I would request, uh, uh, starting with Barun, uh, to share a little bit about your uh, journey and what led you to focus on indoor air quality. Uh, how did you get where you are today? Thank you so much, Tanmay. Very good morning, everyone, panelists, and all the attendees. Uh, thank you for that question, Tanmay. It's a long answer, but I'm going to try and keep it as crisp and short as possible. Uh, I moved back from the U.S. with two small kids. Both of them started developing respiratory problems living in Delhi. I moved, uh, I took a year off and took sabbatical and I was up in the mountains of uh, India in the Himalayas. And I woke up to absolutely crisp, clear blue skies one morning. And I contrasted that with the gray skies of Delhi. This is back in 2010-11. We have a building in Delhi called the Paharpur Business Center. And for the last 40 years, we've had very clean air in that building, certified to be the healthiest building of Delhi by the Central Pollution Control Board, run and operated by my father-in-law. So I ran back from Yamnotri from the mountains and I went to him and I said, you've got a brilliant building. You've got perfect air quality. Your health is good. Why aren't you doing this for others? Why aren't you helping other people? And he said, I've got enough on my plate. Why don't you start something? I thought through this, I started studying the field of indoor air quality and the 30 or 20 years of experience that he had, we took that to market and we started Breathe Easy Consultants in 2013. It's been an incredible journey in the last 11 years. We've done more than 10,000 homes, offices, schools, malls, hospitals, you name it. Any indoor space that you can think of, whether in India, across the country, to international projects in Dhaka, in Sri Lanka, in Dubai, even in Mexico City, uh, we've done some pretty interesting projects around the world today on indoor air quality, probably covering over 15 to 20 million square feet of space, at least, if not more. Uh, the journey has been incredible because one of the, you know, the stories that I like to tell, I'll talk about because this is about stories. Uh, I'm going to talk about two specific stories. Uh, the air quality is a, air quality is a huge problem globally, not just in India, because indoor air quality is a problem because of levels of volatile organic compounds, which are typically generated indoors, and carbon dioxide levels where human breathe human beings breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, 
And these kinds of pollutants stay trapped indoors, and this is a problem globally. However, in India and some other South Asian countries, we have the added problem of external sources of air pollution, i.e. particulate matter and certain gases like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, etc. And what we've been able to do in a lot of these projects that we handle is holistically look at the solution and say, not only are we fixing the VOCs and CO2 that is a global menace in terms of indoor air quality, but how do we also ensure that people breathe really safe and clean air in terms of particulate matter and gases that are present in Delhi's air? In Delhi, as a city, for example, we burn 4,000 4, tons of waste every day, and there's a lot of plastic in our waste. The plastic in that, when it burns, it creates dioxins in the air, and we end up breathing that and causes a lot of health problems. But how do you fix that? So the two stories I was talking about, Diwali night in Delhi, at 2 a.m., we get a call from a mother saying, my child can't breathe, and I'm scared to go out of the house into a hospital. Can you please help me out? My team goes in the middle of the night to the warehouse, picks up an air purifier, this is many years ago, and delivers it to the parents' home. And uh, four hours later, in the morning, we get a call back saying, thanks, thank you so much. Because of what you did, we were able to survive. My child was able to breathe a little bit better because the pollution on that night was really, really horrible. So... And the second story I like to tell people is when I get up, you know, the reason why I get up and come to work every morning is the passion that we have. And all of us, we found our purpose is because we have so many mothers calling us and saying that the use of nebulizers, the use of steroids and inhalers has reduced dramatically with our children and with the elders because of the solutions that we have provided. So it's not just about putting a product but it's about ensuring the end result it's about measuring and monitoring and ensuring that, that you're taking care of your particulate matter you're taking care of the nanoparticles you're taking care of the gases you're taking care of the carbon dioxide and holistically ensuring that you're providing a real good solution uh, i'm sure there are many other questions but yeah no, thank you Barun. Um, that you know we this is uh just to get to know and very interesting uh, that your journey uh, started with a personal experience and now you're uh, providing that expertise to people uh, to solve uh, issues in their homes and offices. Uh, and you, this is a perfect segue to Dr. Neelima Gupta because there's a lot of discussion uh, uh, on indoor environment now, but it wasn't so uh, years ago when you must have started your career. So uh, we, you know, briefly would love to hear your personal and professional journey and how uh, you have uh, now become an advocate for indoor air environment and an ex you're a very, very uh, active uh, executive member of the Society for Indoor Environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tanmay. Uh, and thank you, EDS, for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here. And you are absolutely right. Uh, I started off as an ENT surgeon. And at that time, all my inclinations were towards surgery. I used to operate and I used to love operating. I still do. But uh, um, gradually now, I am uh, as I have been seeing more and more uh, increasing allergic rhinitis, allergic airway diseases, and... Um, I was introduced to Society of uh, Society for Indoor Environment by one of my seniors in public health, Dr. Arun Sharma. He introduced me to this. Uh, before that, we were mainly focusing on uh, ambient air pollution, outdoor air pollution. It has always been an issue. But uh, then as I started interacting, started uh, reading, I did realize that uh, indoor environment can be much worse than uh, indoor air quality can be much worse uh, uh, than outdoor uh, air. And with COVID and we, with people in, with spending increasingly time, uh, increasing time indoors, it became more and more uh, important. And definitely, as uh, Mr. Barun has also said, uh, the use of uh, nebulizers, inhalers, it has been increasing allergic rhinitis uh, from 15% to maybe now it has come to up to 40% in certain areas. So, and uh, allergic asthma in children is increasing. 
uh, though the children are spending more time indoors, still they are having these problems. So definitely it is the need of the hour. So I have been gradually now uh, thinking more and more about it and I'm trying to do uh, what I can to improve this uh, aspect. Thank you. Uh, Chetan, uh, this is uh, your area of uh, uh, expertise and work is uh, really something that we all feel is the is the need of the hour because we really have to raise the awareness and engage people at every level. So we'd love to hear your journey and your professional uh, path that has led you here. Hi, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to this. Um, my professional journey and uh, as a parent, I think it began with the uh, focus on outdoor air pollution. I think that happened for a lot of us, you know, around 2013, 2014, uh, when it started hitting the headlines. Uh, but as far as indoor air quality is concerned, uh, I was a pretty much a late comer to that in the sense that it was only about four, five, six years ago when that began to uh, hit on how severe it can be, how harmful it can be. Uh, and the more I studied into it, the more I found that there were vast gaps, the kind of, you know, uh, work that Barun has spoken about has unfortunately not reached that scale where it should matter, uh, you know, in our preparatory talks, we were talking about this, how it should matter to every home, every office, every workspace. Workspace can, workspaces can be outside also, you know, construction workers and things. So there's the awareness, the, the lack of awareness is something which is still not at par with outdoor air quality. I think there is a lot of focus on outdoor air quality, but not enough on indoor. For, so, so for something like AQI, it's now that's very ubiquitous for outdoor air quality, but can we develop something for indoor air quality? Now, obviously, uh, you know, a, a regulatory system like we have for national, the National Air Quality Index can't be done for indoors, but I'm sure there might be some sort of scope for businesses or for air quality monitors, uh, which can help guide people or help, you know, keep people focused that, you know, this is my CO2 level, this is my TVOC level, this is my, you know, PM 2.5 level. And this is how much above the danger, or this is how much within the safe limit it is. So uh, I think the need for awareness, as Dr. Nilima also pointed out, is a lot more. People need to be aware of it, and then they can they take their own protection in their hands. Thank you. Sachin, of course, this kind of, uh, this scale of a problem requires um, all kinds of solutions. And how do you bring that science into our day-to-day uh, -day life and products? So please uh, briefly tell us about your uh, professional uh, uh, journey. Thank you, Tanmay. So I was very young, you know, so uh, actually I got my first job in a company called Nestle. So this was a tough decision for me to, you know, to quit the job very, very soon and you start something on indoor air quality that was in year 2010 so i started working on my own you know because i actually studied about uh, sick building syndrome in that point of time there was a big vacuum so i actually reached out to some professor in iit delhi professor mukesh Kare is still my mentor till date so so we formed a you know like-minded group and we started working so i see you know like outdoors still people there were some things you know monitoring was happening but indoor was totally vacuum so what was happening, like, you know, indoor, they were like, somebody was talking about plants, somebody was talking about something else. And they were like, people had specifically, there was a problem, people, you know, with the rapid urbanization, we were move, moving to the building without knowing the ill effect of the buildings. So this was a big thing, you know, I wanted to, you know, basically stay in this. This was kind of a passion for me. And, you know, since I quit my job, I said, okay, let's work out something in indoor air quality only. So I started with plants, end up, you know, doing now we create micro bubbles, basically clean air bubbles in a micro environment where we can actually reduce the exposure of anyone. So started from, you know, very big, small idea. Like I was very curious about sick building syndrome, how it happens, like what are the different parameters and we got to know different, you know, so there was less visibility till date we figured it out. Like, you know, uh, 
in terms of like Mr. Uh, uh, he was very right about the outdoor air quality. We have AQI to measure. Till date, whenever we go to the people, they actually confuse uh, AQI with the indoor, you know, the air quality concentration, uh, pollutants concentration. They measure, they say, oh, okay, okay, we, I can check my AQI inside. So they're very confused. So, you know, to comprehend with this kind of problem, it was very typical. So that's why we thought, you know, let's let's create some visibility around this indoor air quality issue so that, you know, eventually we could develop something. That's how I started. Now we are in a position, you know, we we end up like we do a lot of, so we, we don't go and sell anything actually. That's how we work. So typically people come to us for a solution and we give them solution. That's Thank how we Yeah. And I'm I, 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 I'm very intrigued by your bubble concept. So we will definitely have questions on that. Uh, but now let's let's get into those questions. We have some questions that are coming up online, and I also request our experts to uh, type in the messages and question answers whenever they can. The, the more, the better. But let's go through. And I have a number of questions for all of you, uh, and we'd like to cover as many as possible today. So let's keep answers crisp and and try to address as many as we can. So Barun. Uh, what you're suggesting, uh, what I could understand that there are things that one can do, but are there any quick fixes in this problem where we have a massive outdoor pollution uh, and indoor sources of pollutants? Is there a quick fix? So, Tanmay, that you know, we've written a book. Uh, I have a couple of copies over here in my bookshelf. It's called How to Grow Fresh Air. And the Hindi translation of that book also just was released about a month and a half ago. And that really outlines a lot of very simple things that people can do to potentially reduce the exposure to air pollution. Some of it being indoor produced and some of it outdoor. Indoor produced, very simple, uh, very simple quick fixes. Reduce your clutter, reduce carpets in your homes. Uh, don't use chemicals uh, specifically like uh, cleaning chemicals and other sprays and deodorants and other uh, all kinds of sprays that people use perhaps for cockroaches for mosquito repellents etc so stay away from a lot of these because they produce volatile organic compounds when using paint you want to reduce uh, the kind of paint or the voc uh, generating paints that you would use in indoor spaces as well these are simple things that people can really do on an, on their own perspective However, I've come across, uh, you know, I've, I created this uh, seven stages of being air aware. And I want to quickly go through these seven stages. You know, people go through this learning slowly and steadily. And they realize that air pollution, you know, they may start with just putting a natural plant. I call that stage one. You put a natural plant or a few natural plants in the room and you feel, wow, I've got really good air. Uh, the second part is when they... Uh, when they say, okay, I want to upgrade this and I think it's not really helping me enough, I'm going to put an air purifier in my room. So they go to the market, they buy a consumer grade air purifier and there are many available, whether it's a Dyson or a Philips or a Sharp or a Honeywell, or there's a lot of brands available on the market. So that's stage two. And a lot of times they'll add monitoring to that to tell them what is the air quality. And if they get the right monitor, as Nidhi was mentioning earlier, in terms of measuring particulate matter and carbon dioxide, then they realize, oops, my carbon dioxide is a big problem. What do I do with that? The next stage, they start talking to others and they start putting these, you know, nowadays these ductable air conditioners are there and they start putting electrostatic precipitators and magnetic filters and these kinds of ionizers and all sorts of active filtration technologies. And as they start reading more, they go up to a next level of understanding, which is the fourth stage. And they get a really high quality air purifier which removes nanoparticles and even gases in the air. The fifth stage, they'll start putting machines outside their home perhaps, which push in air through HEPA filters and a fan and ensure that it brings down your particulate matter and your carbon dioxide in, this, in, in your home. So that's stage five. Uh, the next stage is when you put in a really good quality air purifier, which will remove your nanoparticles and gases and bring air from outside and get you to really good air quality inside your home as well. And then the last stage is when you holistically take care of the entire problem, ensuring that your humidity levels, your temperature in terms of heat in the summertime and or heat in the wintertime and cool in the summertime and your nanoparticles and gases are taken care of. So these are the seven stages of evolving into learning of indoor air quality. 
And the last bonus stage, as I call it, is when you also include sustainability into that. And when you look at decarbonizing your built environment so that you're not only living a more sustainable life in terms of energy, but also a healthier and cleaner life in terms of air pollution. Thank you uh, and for bringing out that linkage especially, but it does seem like uh, that there are things that one could do. And I will come back to you later uh, to ask about specific recommendations and also best practices. But I uh, wanted to ask uh, Dr. Nilima, uh, that from a medical standpoint, uh, you have uh, just outlined in your uh, opening statement about uh, increasing cases of people getting exposure and, and medical problems. But one of the questions, is it actually getting worse? Uh, what is the current state of IAQ? Uh, was it always like this? And uh, uh, what has caused, in your opinion, this the, the, this spike that you see? See, uh, I think it is definitely getting worse. The incidence of allergic rhinitis is increasing. And allergic rhinitis has a number of uh, causes. And exposure to aeroallergens is uh, one of them. But aeroallergens, we have mostly outdoors, the pollens. But we are finding increasing allergy to house dust mite, uh, cockroach, uh, pet dander was always there. So these are the two, three important things which have come up. Uh, almost all of the studies have found that house dust mite is one of the very, very common causes cause of allergic rhinitis. So that is there. And uh, house dust mite can be controlled with some limit with some easy to do um, things we can't control it completely because in our environment uh, is such that you can't control uh, dust and house dust mite completely but we can do certain things which can reduce the um, uh, house dust mite as per uh, allergic uh, asthma that is also increasing and uh, that is more linked to the uh, particulate matter. So particulate matter by from tobacco smoke or from uh, cooking emissions or uh, tiny, these are the tiny particles that are suspended in the air. So dust and uh, uh, this can lead to, because they penetrate the lung and lead to uh, lung problems. So asthma is because mostly because of particulate matter. So these things can be, I think we'll be later talking about the mitigation strategies, but these are definitely affecting the health. And I indoor air quality is worsening, maybe because of the increasing urbanization and uh, also climate change, because climate change is also affecting the uh, carbon dioxide levels, the relative humidity that our buildings are having. So which from outdoor comes to indoors as well. And also the increased use of appliances uh, uh, in the offices, that is also the workplace environment. That is also one of the major contributors. Use of printers, use of, uh, uh, we are not using proper exhaust then definitely. Humidity. So all those things are affecting the indoor air uh, quality. I'm sure we'll be talking about it uh, later as I well. I think there are two, two things that have come out that are, I, I have wondered, and a lot of other people do, one is about, of course, the requirement for ventilation, but does it also not bring in the pollutants in? And you know, how do you balance for a normal household or an office? But Dr. Nima, this one important point that you picked up is, is on uh, cooking. And uh, there's a lot of questions that we, we get about, uh, is the smoke that is generated during cooking uh, affecting health in a negative way? Uh, or are there things that we should uh, be particularly concerned about from a cooking perspective? And if you can quickly also say, are there any solutions to that? Yeah, definitely. Because see, Indian cooking is not uh, about steaming things and uh, uh, microwaving uh, things. It is more about uh, doing frying. We saute. We, we are making use... We are used to making tadka. We will make our own pears, tomatoes, and then we will make our own vegetables. We will make our own vegetables. So all that is generating emissions. So if 
uh, everyone can't afford uh, good chimneys, but having an exhaust hood, having an uh, exhaust which is installed in the uh, kitchen and using it. In the sense, as soon as you start doing that uh, cooking process, you use that exhaust so that you have ventilated uh, the kitchen. That those emissions need to go out. They don't have to stay inside the kitchen. We may have small kitchens and this these emissions, if they stay in the uh, kitchen, they are you are getting exposed to those uh, emissions. So women and children will be especially vulnerable to uh, these uh, emissions. If we are using a gas stove, now biomass fuels are not being used, but they were especially dangerous. But uh, even now, if we are frying or uh, sorting, and if we are using using and reusing the, uh, the oil that uh, we are using, so that definitely emits uh, these compounds, which are harmful to the health of the uh, lady. So ventilation in the kitchen is very, very uh, important. Thank you. I think that was a great, clear, crisp answer. Thank you, Dr. Nirma. Uh, Chetan, this, we, have had, we have had a few people in the audience also ask this question right now, that this awareness about air and what we breathe, uh, it's seasonal. And we get a lot of attention when there is an adverse outdoor air uh, event, uh, mostly in the winter. And uh, you know, in your experience, really, one, is it really true that you know this this is something that uh, uh, we lose focus on? And what is required in your experience that sustains? Uh, this dialogue because the solutions if we have to have to be applied throughout the year and it's not really uh, something that you can do in a spot basis from what i hear from our experts right so um from what i've seen is that a awareness plays a great role in uh, mainstreaming health risks like air pollution we've seen that with aqi now the aqi in india came in uh, when was it? I think in April 2015, uh, the National EQI was launched. And in a matter of a couple of years, uh, this whole concept of AQI, AQI uh, really captured the imagination of a lot of people, right? Because we had many severe uh, air pollution, severe air pollution episodes, not just in Delhi, but across North India, many more reports started coming out, right? So awareness is critical. Now, as far as indoor air pollution is concerned, that kind of awareness is, I think, far from uh, public imagination. Uh, there are also very, it's also a very complex landscape. You've got, uh, you know, uh, rural clusters, home clusters, which the Ujwala scheme has tried to address. Uh, there has been a fair amount of success. That can be strengthened according to several surveys. Uh, there is urban, uh, you know, urban residential areas, both low income and higher income, which uh, uh, Dr. Nilima has also uh, addressed in buildings in, I think uh, a lot of um, awareness could be created very impactfully in uh, the official complexes, uh, modern buildings, even old buildings where these monitors can be installed, where uh, users, office goers can continuously see it. Uh, it will help to raise awareness so they can see the CO2, they can see the PM2.5, they can see VOCs and they can sort of get, uh, keep track of that. So, you know, for CO2, and this was a learning for, for me a couple of years ago, as it rises, you start to feel groggy, you start to feel sluggish. You can uh, sense your productivity going down. When PM2.5 rises, you tend to get a headache. And I'm sure that, that must be the case with the VOCs also. You know, there will be some kind of uh, allergic reaction. So by displaying the data, the data is extremely important. By uh, displaying the data continuously in public spaces, and that we know happens in hotels, in metro stations, uh, but displaying it in, say, offices, official comp complexes, um, malls, that would go a long way in raising awareness about linking the data with how you're feeling and for managers on how much productivity is increasing. That's a great idea. And I, 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 I can see that there are, 
instances where, of course, outdoor air pollution and the signs that we see uh, have helped raise the awareness. And in a few cases uh, where we have indoor air monitors, uh, people react to it and they actively engage with their indoor environment. And Sachin, I wanted to bring this technology part and the product part in here that you know, for a, a household or an office or a public space, we're talking about Metro and others, uh, we have to have solutions that are affordable and that are some that are available to people across uh, all kinds of situations. So, what is your uh, your recommendation? As it what what are, what is the role of technology? What are the products, um, in the, especially monitors and filters uh, that you think are available and ready to use now? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, indoor is a very complex, you know, it's not just about talking about three, four, five pollutants, there are many more, you know, if we talk about then, you know, mold and mildews will come into the picture. There are different types of, you know, many types of VOCs, formaldehyde, PM2.5, so just talk about, we are emitting, then body particles, then something is coming from here and there, then some biological agents basically there, so it's a very complex thing. But always, like, you know, this is one of the basic protocol for IAQ. Wherever, whatever guidelines has been designed, the first protocol for IAQ improvement is improving ventilation rate. And there is a catch line actually behind it. So ventilation from what? Ventilation not from polluted air. Ventilation from clean air. That's the, you know, thing. So that's how, you know, so basically... I would be rather preferring a house, like, you know, there were many questions, schools are there, you know, the kids, schools being shut down, for what reason? Kids, you know, the kids have been, you know, maybe living in a place where they're exposed to more pollutants inside, right? So this has been established many times. Indoor can be many, many polluted from outdoor if you don't properly manage it. There are people, you like, you know, people call us and they tell us. So basically understanding of pollutants has gone really down, you know? So to comprehend with so many type, kinds of pollutants, very, 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 you know, difficult for any layman or for say, even for technical expert. And it is actually evolving science. That's why, you know, we have not stopped learning. As I know, like solution provider, where we have like eight, 10 good tech people in our team from different IITs, Stanford, you know, we're continuously learning. Every time we, we have a different problem when you try to solve that, right? So this is how it has happened. So there's no one uh, perfect solution for this kind of problem, but yes, ventilation should be your first protocol. Whenever you see there is a lot of panata smell in every room, then there is an IAQ problem. That's how we relate to it. When you see, okay, every day in my household, on my glass shops, I see a dust deposition, you need something to do about it, basically. And you try to hide things, that is a big, bigger problem. How do we try to hide things? If there's a smell, oh, I'll put a perfume in my room, or, you know, I'll spray more perfume in my body, or you know, I have some diffuser in my house. That is an IAQ problem. If you actually, you know, I have seen a lot of big houses, big bungalows, big, you know, so they started, they, they have not taken responsibility of their air. If you not take responsibility of air that you breathe, nobody's going to take care about it. That's why the air quality monitoring, that too, not for a very short term. It should be monitored 24-7, 365 days. It shouldn't be like, you know, minutes measurement and you are happy about it. Somebody can actually, you know, actually come and uh, make, make, make fool of you because, you know, they'll just quickly fix something and they say, oh, this is the value. Do, you're not going to get fooled by these. You know, I met people who have bought big fancy purifiers and they were told, okay, when you see this green light, everything is okay. They used to turn off those purifier after that. This is not the kind of understanding that you want to take it forward. It's not about the technology or something. It's about, you know, spending time about, about it, basically, you know, taking interest into this particular subject. So first thing, you know, since it's a very complex thing, there are many other things. So first protocol should be ventilation management. Then we come to a point, it should be a hygiene issue. So, you know, as Mr. Barun said, and Mr. Chetan said, it's basically a very complex hygiene issue. So people like to, like, they have built fancy HUs, but I've seen, you know, people have made HUs inside their house and they were storing paints, varnishes. They were storing, you know, inside, I, I went to a corporate office and their HUs, people were hanging their boots, basically. It was a, you know, shoe rack kind of a space. Now you imagine air is being transported from that place and carrying all the particles that was there. So what kind of things you're breathing? So this is, this is you know, the, actually to cut off from outdoor was a typical problem. So we started understanding how to, first of all, cut off from the outdoor, you know, why, how we cannot let the outdoor particles enter your house. 
And the second approach we adopted is basically ventilation is the primary, you know, concern for everybody. We we can't let the CO2, you know, uh, peak to a level where it becomes, you know, very uncomfortable. So I have met people who have, like, you know, they have the fanciest mattresses in their house, fanciest air purifier in their house. And when they wake up in the morning, they rush to the balconies because they don't feel fresh. They feel trapped, you know, they feel, oh, they have slept for a good few, eight, nine hours, but they're not, you know, no, they're not actually that, uh, they feel restless. They go to the balconies to get that freshness. Why can't we make it happen inside that house all the time? That's how, you know, we work out basically. So solutions are not typically, that's why, you know, monitoring the exposure is very important. The moment we started monitoring the exposure, then we actually make it, made it very personal. I made it personal for any, every individual of the, of, you know, in that household. So a lady who is actually involved in the cooking may be having a higher exposure. Then a person who was actually, you know, actually has gone to the office and have done some work, 95% time indoor, was not involved in something where, you know, so many particles or so many other uh, pollutants were emitted. He might have some lesser exposure. So all the, like, if there are five households in a house, they might have a different kind of exposure. How do we cut down to a level where, you know, there are, there are no chances of developing them some serious disease? So it should not be like, you know, how people perceive air quality or air pollution issue in India. It's seasonal. It's not seasonal. If we are not able to maintain our exposure, even if in the, like, the outside was 50, I have seen, you know, people breathing when the paratha was cooking, the PM levels were 300, 350. Maybe there was some polyacromatic, hydro, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. We put nephthalene ball, it also releases. People started using camphors. People, people have, so this is basically kind of a cutoff. We have, we have to, you know, we have like some patients in the house. It's kind of a paradigm shift for everybody. You know, the first yeah. thing we go and tell people is basically come back. You know, why do you broom in your house? Maybe we can we can do that mopping in our houses when we have those all those fancy you know marbles in the house. This is basically a problem where monitoring can bring that visibility. If there is a visibility, we are going to take action about it. We'll be more learn learned yeah. about it. There's, I think that's a great. So, you know, we we uh, we had an experience of installing uh, air quality monitors in an office space. Uh, Hello. during COVID and looking at uh, indoor air quality as a proxy to COVID exposure danger. And what we found out, uh, interestingly, that even though everything else was fine, there were huge spikes in VOCs. And eventually it turned out that the cleaning chemicals that were used to fight the COVID the, the, uh, and the things that were being sprayed were actually causing much more serious problems and they were lasting in the space for hours. So yeah. you had everything fine, but you know, if you just went and cleaned the, the, the office room two or three times in a day with, with chemicals that are not appropriate, it actually made it worse. So half-life half life of basically the perfume that we have, the particles or VOCs released from that is basically close to, it, it ranges from days to weeks actually. So you imagine, you know, we constantly pump all those pollutants. They are going to stay in the indoor. I would so, li just like to mention yes. an interesting fact. Uh, previously, we used to burn the kachua chap. Yes. The coil, the mosquito coil. So one mosquito coil is... Uh, Burning that is equivalent to uh, smoking 20 to 25 cigarettes. Wow. So this much is the uh, emission from uh, harmful emission from that uh, mosquito coil. So, the, so there are certain things which are definitely releasing a lot of uh, harmful uh, emission, which we don't realize, but we are getting exposed to that day in and day out. So we have to change these things that we are uh, exposed to. Cooking oil, we can use a better cooking oil, which has a higher uh, smoking point. So less smoke is generated from that uh, cooking oil. Cleaning products, we can use better cleaning products, more natural cleaning products, which do not emit these fumes. So they may not be visible, but they do release small uh, particulate matter, small, all these paints, varnishes, Another interesting fact I would like to tell you that a study said that uh, pregnancy should be planned in the sense that if you are pregnant and your house is being renovated, it is being painted, it has a risk of uh, leading to genetic abnormalities in the uh, child. So these uh, paints, varnishes, so they are emitting such harmful products that if you are uh, pregnant, it can lead to complications in your pregnancy. 
so imagine we are uh, yeah, we are no, uh, this is you know this, i mean this is eye opening because when you talk about paints when you talk about cleaning chemicals uh, or the, the the example that you gave of oil uh, we look at all other factors. We look at the health impact of the oil content that we consume. Uh, but all these other effects, they're not even documented in a way that uh, yes. someone making these decisions, whether they're buying a cleaning product or oil, can consider. So, Barun, are there best practices globally? You've now studied this. That are there best practices globally of communicating this uh, is there an indoor air quality label that can be addressed this is a good because we talk about paints and there's a lot of awareness about low voc paints but that's about it in, that i hear when you look at products but all these other things and especially things like ventilation which are very difficult to actually say that how is it better ventilated or not without putting in a monitor yeah. can you give us some examples two things one are there best practices of how it is managed also I want to hear, as you said, stories of where people have actually solved these problems or done something better so that we know that they're not just problems, but there is a way to get around it as well. Sure. Thanks, Tanmay. Uh, so this is a fairly large topic, right? Because now you're getting into building material. You have three minutes. <laughs> All right. So you're getting into building materials and building science uh, in terms of uh, design, in terms of choosing the right materials, and there are a couple of different uh, the couple of different certifications that are out there which talk about uh, which materials to use in terms of lower volatile organic compounds, so that from a long term perspective, your building is more sustainable and healthier for the occupants. One of the key things that one can do is look for the right kinds of certifications in terms of the end result of the building. For example, the US Green Building Council has certifications for uh, LEED certification and now the WELL certification, uh, which talks about health and wellness within an occupied space. The WELL certification, when it came out, had nearly 35% of its points related towards indoor air quality. So if you are following all of the parameters that are in that well standard, for example, you will ensure that the materials that you have used within that particular building or space are of the right quality, which are not emitting the kind of volatile organic compounds or emissions that typically somebody who doesn't know enough would end up spending or, or using. One more thing I want to just touch upon is the cost of going green. A lot of people think that it's very expensive to put a green building and it, the extra cost of using materials which are low VOC or zero VOC is extremely high and they shy away from it. However, if you look at the life cycle cost of the building, if you truly go with green products and green solutions, you may end up paying three, four, five percent more upfront from a capital expense perspective. But in the long run, in terms of health, productivity, and even more so, the actual cost of maintenance of the building will perhaps be lower if you go in for uh, solutions which are green. If you talk about real life examples, Tanmay, there are thousands of them, right? I will start with our own example in our own building, Paharpur Business Center. We are India's first retrofit LEED Platinum certified building. We are India's first IGBC, the other certified certifying agencies like the Indian Green Building Council, Griha, Terry, et cetera. We are India's first IGBC health and well-being platinum certified building. How have we achieved that for a building that is 40 years old as a retrofit? And I say this literally tongue in cheek. If I can do this in a building that is 40 years old, then anybody can do this in any building in this country because a 40-year-old building can achieve this. New buildings can certainly achieve sustainability and health uh, parameters. And even retrofit buildings can achieve it. How do you do this? By being conscious in your purchasing decisions, by ensuring that what you're bringing into that building is sustainable. First, first step, I say reduce. Consumption is the bane of our society. So reduce what you don't need. Don't just buy indiscriminately. But when you do need to buy, then ensure that it is the right quality and the right kind in terms of materials. So the wood that we buy, ensuring that it is the right certified wood, which is not giving out very, very high VOCs. The polish that is done on the wood on a regular basis, ensuring that polish is done either outdoors 
or when the exhaust systems are on or using very low VOC polished material or, or the thinners that are used are very different quality thinners which will ensure that the VOCs that are emitted from that product eventually are reduced. So there's a whole process to this in terms of all the materials, whether it's not just the cleaning materials, which of course will have a huge impact because you're using them day in and day out. But your long-term products, your furniture, your paint, your, your even, even the bricks that are being used today, fly ash bricks, other bricks, can have the, some of them have the potential to perhaps emit certain types of VOCs depending on what material was used to make them. So a lot of science is already there and there are certifying bodies which will tell you what is the impact of some of these materials that, are you, that you are using in a building so that you're, you can ensure that you have good quality air or good quality healthy uh, air inside those spaces. Thank you. So what I hear is that there are decisions related to improving the environment both the general environment, but also your indoor environment. In most of the decisions that one would take in terms of uh, building, operating, maintaining a building, whether it's a house or an office. And uh, in some of us who are working in offices, spending more time indoors, there is a clear uh, way to look at uh, workspaces to be better uh, uh, designed and operated for indoor air quality, those who are working outdoors have still to challenge, uh, face the challenge of increasing pollution. And that's where uh, I was also looking at Sachin, that, you know, what is this bubble that you're talking about? Is it a bubble that I can carry with me uh, outdoor, yeah. indoor? Exactly. So, I mean, uh, we started having the indoor bubbles basically for indoor spaces, wherever, like you, you have an office, you have a micro office, you know, you, you have your house. We started treating all those spaces as a single unit. The air in those spaces should be in your bathroom, in your kitchen, in your room, living room, everywhere. It should be the same without, you know, having so many interventions inside because people were fed up, you know, putting 15, 17 air purifier everywhere, so many things. So we started decongesting all those places with minimalistic intervention to uniformize the air and to cut off from the outdoor pollution. How we can make it, you know, uh, sustainable and for a longer term. So our job is to maintain air inside that bubble for a longer period. And we our intention is to make it within WHO safe limit. Whatever you know has been the upgrade till date, we are actually up to the line. So this is the latest that like what we could do. So our job is to maintain your. So when exposure. you say bubble, you mean yes. to say it's the house is your bubble. Your house is your bubble, your car is your bubble, your office is your bubble, your school classroom is your bubble, your gymnasium is your bubble, all those places we could do it. Now we started working on something I was working on, it's, like, it's been four years now. Like even if you walk outside, we can create a bubble. We did it. We did an experiment on a larger scale for McKinsey. Now we are doing it for individuals as of now. So this will be coming very soon. So we are working on it. So we, if you fix your 90, 95%, we could, could also fix your 5%, which is also very complicated. People are not very happy wearing masks and there's no like, you know, guarantee it is going to protect you. So we started having something which is, you know, not messy around it. It's not visible. So we actually, you know, what we did is we made the invisible thing visible and which was visible, we made it invisible. That's how we were working. That's where the you know, bubble works. That's how the bubble works. So I um, can't wait to uh, see the outdoor one. And we have... Uh, I mean, so many people who are facing health challenges just because they're exposed to pollution, but within indoor environment, uh, what you are talking about, is this something that a household can afford? Yeah, so we started having it very, so it is like much cheaper than having purifiers at your home as of now still like you. So adoption was very faster. We did it for our family and friends. And like we have people who recommended it for 90 to 95 people in their circle. That's how it actually, the you know, because since earlier they were like standalone examples of something, you know, which was having the outstanding right. air quality. We started delivering in every home, every place we touch. So as long as, you know, it meets that requirement, as you're saying, 90 to 95 percent reduction and is affordable. It's something that can be scaled and taken up by everyone. So Chetan. How, you know, I mean, listening to all the experts and our experiences of uh, how things can be done in a better way, how decision, how do you take this to to people who actually don't know most of these things? I mean, I don't know half of these things. You're on mute. 
Uh, yeah, it's actually been quite fascinating listening to Satya and Dr. Nilima and Barun because, you know, the way they have actually very simply conveyed the problem. Uh, on one hand, you have a complicated term like VOCs, even PM 2.5. I think most a lot of people still don't understand. They may understand the AQI, uh, but the way they can, uh, you know, conveyed it, conveyed the messaging, uh, pains, the link between pains and uh, pre the threat to pregnancies, mosquito coils equals a packet of cigarettes, a 20 pack of cigarettes. Uh, paratha smoke, and if you see dust on your desk, you're breathing that also. The challenge, I think, is on how to convert this into uh, public safety awareness campaigns. Uh, the challenge is to get regulatory backing for this. So, for instance, if it's uh, the mosquito coils which are causing this problem, uh, frankly, I haven't really seen that anywhere. But if there is uh, research into it, can that be published? Can that be publicized? Uh, can it be used uh, in situations where it's safe? I can't think of any, but maybe there is. I don't know. So that kind of evidence-based PSAs uh, is, I think, what would go a long way in protecting people, regardless of the kind of uh, you know uh, enclosure they're in, whether it's a home, whether it's a low-income right. home, high-income home, or offices. And and do you see that there is a way for us to go there? To, to get that level of... Yes, yes, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, there is already an awareness about air pollution. Uh, two, uh, you know, the new kinds of media that we are using, social media and all, is tremendous in amplifying solid, powerful messaging, right? Not jargon-based, not scientific reports, but simplified uh, way, the way that they have been communicating. The third point is that this generation, which is coming up, and most of, uh, I think the majority is under, I think, 28 or 35 or something like that. They're very aware about the environment. They're very aware about the kind of, uh, uh, you know, quality of life that they want, their work-life balance. And generally, the awareness is a lot. So I think um, with a bit of push, with a bit of uh, evidence-based research being pushed out, there is uh, a chance for... A much greater impact than we've seen. Great. Uh, we, we have maybe another 10 minutes. Uh, I will come back to all of you with a final word of uh, uh, wisdoms, wisdom for us. But before that, Dr. Nilima, there's this one question that's recurring in the question that people are asking is uh, uh, if we look at ventilation as being one of the solutions plants being another solution that every day use, uh, uh, we can put them in our lives. Then uh, are there any challenges when you look at, you open the air and it's very polluted outside. Is it still better to ventilate uh, unfiltered uh, air? Uh, when Is CO2, indoor dust and other things mitigated in a way, but not counteracted by something worse that we let in? See, we have to be mindful of uh, the ventilation at all times. If we feel that the outside air has a very high uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10 and the AQI is really bad, it is better to keep the windows and doors closed at that time. And ventilation, when we are talking about, we are talking about ventilation of the kitchen when we are releasing uh, emissions. So at that time, it has to definitely be well ventilated. When we, when we are in winters, when we are taking bath in the uh, bathrooms, the bathroom has to have the exhaust after we have taken the bath. Because if you will retain that humidity in the bathroom, it will encourage growth of mold. And, uh, so, and even in kitchens, when we, uh, we have to plumb all the leakages, we have to keep it dry and ventilated. So ventilation is one of the very important things. And having an effective ventilation, the exhaust it should not be like covered in grease and uh, there are no pores. We Generally, we tend to put a net in front of the exhaust so that uh, maybe lizards don't enter uh, uh, the house. But then if it is all clogged up uh, in grease, then that ventilation won't help. Similarly, for, kitchen, for the chimneys, we have beautiful chimneys installed, but we are getting them clean maybe um, once in uh, one and a half years or so, maybe once on Diwali. 
So because it is like a thousand rupees for getting a chimney clean, but if it is clogged and your paratha fumes are not getting sapped in the exhaust, though so they will stay in the kitchen. So effective ventilation and ventilation, we have to be mindful of the ventilation. Uh, once you've cooked the paratha and then you've been there and then someone reminds you, oh, you did not switch off the switch on the ventilator, the exhaust, then what's the point? So that's uh, that will definitely help. And opening the windows and doors, but preferably not at the time when the outside uh, pollution is uh, too much. Then maintaining a good temperature and humidity level in the house. Sometimes you'll go at some places, the house feels so damp. The moisture is there in the house. So that will go away only when you are doing, you are switching on the exhaust and opening the windows to decrease that uh, uh, moisture. Sometimes when I enter my son's room, he's like, all the windows are closed, the curtains are drawn. He would not let the sun in because wakes up late and then sits and uh, reads. So you have to let the sun in. Uh, whenever you are getting that sun, you should let the sun uh, in. I think um, Dr. S uh, Mr. Sachin will definitely agree um, uh, uh, with this. And, yeah, and then making conscious choices that uh, the fuel that we are using mm, is a good quality. Uh, things like uh, not doing excessive grooming uh, rather than doing a wet mopping. Uh, house dust might very effective control is changing our linen um, frequently, washing it in warm water so that those house dust, dust mites, they are killed. Cockroach is another very important allergen. So decreasing that, uh, blocking the cracks and crevices in our kitchen, keeping less number of articles getting that minimalistic uh, thing. Previously, I think wall-to-wall -wall carpets and heavy upholstery, that was the in thing. But now people are realizing that uh, carpets gather so much dust. And how do you clean them? You will dust them and that all that dust will be again released into your uh, environment and you will inhale that. So heavy material for the sofas. So upholstery is very important, heavy curtains. So they gather too much dust and you don't, you don't dry clean them, you don't wash them that frequently. So they keep on accumulating uh, dust. So if we can afford, we can, we should do vacuum cleaning at least two times uh, in the week so that we don't have to dust them using the cloth. Those, those practices generate too much dust in the um, indoor environment rather vacuum than dust it. Do a wet mopping, the tables, the floor, better to do a wet mopping than generating that dust using the broom. So these some mitigation strategies we can use. Yeah, it's eye-opening. So we have the, we have to really change the way uh, we do simple things daily that affect our air quality. Uh, Baron, the last question for you, uh, there's a lot of questions we're getting from uh, participants on plants. And uh, of course, everyone realizes that they are good, but uh, is that enough? And if you have to give some advice on what is the best way to use plants? Uh, is, is it better to have them concentrated? Is it better to have them distributed? Do we keep plants in a car also? I mean, what do we, what is your advice on the plants uh, for indoor air quality? So the first part is, yes, plants can actually be life-changing when it comes to indoor air quality. Our building in Paharpur Business Center has 7,000 natural plants inside, and they not only help in reducing volatile organic compounds and particulate matter, but they also help in reducing the energy of the building. A longer conversation to explain that. However, one quick story I want to talk say over here. In our rooftop in the building in Paharpur Business Center, when we were redoing that space, the way the flooring is done, we couldn't redo the entire flooring. So we decided to put the uh, artificial green color turf material, which is polyester based. When we bought that material and we rolled it out as a carpet on that entire rooftop, there were extremely strong odors from the vinyl polyester material and they were very high the voc meter was just 
shot the numbers shot through the roof and we were very concerned that you know a building that is so proud of the air quality inside cannot be putting a material like this even though we had tried to get the best material possible the vocs were off the charts but we decided to move forward anyways and we said let's keep going before we launch we'll see what the readings are and then we'll decide what to do the next step in the process of evolving that greenhouse, that lattice rooftop, was putting the plants of the greenhouse. And we put in close to about 1,400 money plants, uh, about waist-high plants, money plants hanging from the, the top to on the floor. And once those 1,400 money plants were there, magic happened inside that particular space. All the VOCs, and this is there's a book, right? Again, another one in my bookshelf over here, which talks about 50 house plants that are very good at improving indoor air quality. Uh, and the VOCs removing plant is actually the money plant or the golden potholes, as it's called. It within two days of putting those plants, the entire smell went away, and the VOC meter stopped giving a higher reading in terms of volatile organic compounds. So plants can be therapeutic. Plants can help in improve, improving indoor air quality. They are phenomenal. However, my caveat that I have to put in there is that just putting a normal plant in a bedroom and thinking that it's fixed all my air quality problems in a city like Delhi or a country like India is not going to happen. It's not going to get my particulate matter to the levels I want. It's not going to get my CO2 to the levels I want. It's not going to get my VOCs to the levels I want. You would need literally a jungle inside a bedroom in order to even get close to what, where you want to get to. So you do need intervention in terms of mechanical solutions to get to the final result of really clean and healthy air. But still, plants are therapeutic. Plants are natural, God-given. There's enough science behind how therapeutic they are in terms of mindset, in terms of uh, depression in terms of releasing anxiety and all of those other things. So from all, from a health perspective, it's a great idea to put plants. Yes, they improve the air quality, but not enough to give us perfect air quality in a country like India. Thank you. Um, we've actually run out of time, but I still want my final word of wisdom from all of you. So maybe in one minute, uh, what are the top one or two recommendations you'll have for people at home and in offices to improve their indoor air quality. I'll go with Dr. Neelima first. Uh, I would like to say, uh, I've said enough about effective uh, ventilation. So effective ventilation to dilute the pollutants that we are uh, exposed to. We can't have 100% uh, removal of the pollutants, but at least we can dilute the pollutants by effective ventilation. And then making conscious choices to reduce the level of uh, pollutants, to generate less and less uh, uh, pollutants. So these two strategies uh, I would like to recommend. And I would like to take a point from uh, Mr. Chetan that he said that uh, we have to raise the awareness. See, where did this all plants uh, came from? Suddenly, everyone was saying, put this uh, snake plant, put this, 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 this. And I think they marketed it so well that everyone uh, rushed to... There are some people may not have a house big enough to put those plants. And even those plants need maintenance. Uh, it's not that they are totally maintenance free. See, I put plant in my office, it dies in 15, 20 uh, days. So you have to have sturdy indoor plants, which are also pollution controlling. So we have to raise the awareness as these plants uh, um, came into vogue. We have to raise the awareness of practices that will lead to less and less pollutant generation. So the engineers, they are working on it. They are designing new and new materials which emit less VOCs. Uh, we can, as a layman, we can uh, use and do activities that generate less and less uh, pollutants using good fuel, using good cleaning agents, uh, maybe doing wet mopping more frequently than um, raising the dust by brooming maintaining our exhaust, maintaining our filters, maintaining our air condition filters, having a less number of items in our living room and in the bedroom, 
just not lie the let the uh, clothes lie around uh, in the house because they generate they attract dust they accumulate dust and when you wear them they you are exposed to those pollutants so so there are a lot of strategies that we can do uh, but, i'm uh, sure and we will definitely i think the interest that we have on this subject we will definitely come back to all of you for further sessions chetan what are your final thoughts on this for today's webinar right well, uh... Uh, apart from the awareness thing, I think it would be to try and uh, well, firstly, I would call upon the experts like we have on the uh, to on the panel to communicate a lot more on in the simple way that they have on this panel to communicate on say social media or through articles or whatever it is on the, the harmful effects and the simplicity in understanding uh, indoor air pollution. The second thing, a bit more top level, would be. Um, can we make, can we popularize the use of small, cheap, affordable uh, air quality monitors, which can measure CO2, which can measure VOCs, PM2.5? At the moment, I think they tend to be expensive, but even if they're sort of cheaper versions, and even if it's, there's an error margin of, say, 5, 10, 15 percent also, I think it would be okay because, you know, at the moment, the awareness and the levels of pollution are so, awareness is low, pollution is high. Even those would work. I think there's, there might be a business opportunity over there. And uh, thirdly, I think uh, it would be going back to my thing, if you're an estate manager or in some kind of an office manager, invest in this. Invest in putting up uh, monitoring. Invest in putting up solutions. Because the immediate uh, you know, result in your productivity in your bottom line is a lot. It's been proved by World Bank studies. It's been uh, proved by Harvard reports and, and so on. Thank you, Sachin. I would like to add a few points here. Basically, you know, we were talking about the kitchen chimneys. So I'll just add two things to it. The kitchen chimneys, you have a kitchen chimney in your house, just rinse it uh, like, you know, either once a week or twice a week. It's going to, you know, reduce your exposure by a lot. Just switch your, you know, normal, if you're using oil-based dia in your house or incense stick in your house, just replace this with Gika dia. This helps a lot. Third thing, you know, these are simplistic things. Like, you know, she was saying, talking, the Nilima member was talking about, you know, replacing brooming with the wet mopping. We can do it. You know, most of our house, house are a tile house. We should do it basically by default. Fourth, I'll say, you know, it's more of a hygiene issue for every one of us. The more hygiene you maintain, the things are simplistic. Even, even keeping our shoes outside is a bigger IAQ shift, basically. It's a paradigm shift. You know, we we'll start thinking about it. And we have to make it more personal, basically. This is what I believe with, you know, much more visibility around the kind of pollutants we have with the monitoring, obviously. That's these are my recommendation for this. Thank you. Thank in, you so in, much. Incense sticks not to be used. Yes, at all. So, yeah. And also, I would like to add one more thing, because there were not many questions around plants. People get by plants from the nurseries. And they can be laced with a lot of, you know, the fertilizers into it. It's a bigger yeah. problem. Fertilizers, mold. Yes. There's problems with not maintained. Yes. So whenever, you, whenever you buy them, properly rinse them twice, thrice, four times in water, proper water. We've done a lot of research. Like in our office also, you'll find a lot of, there are mood lifters. You know, you feel, you experience your air with the plants when the leaves move. The stomata should be clean. You know, we have seen in people's house plants, with lots of dust deposited on this. That's, they are not going to help you in any way. They should be clean, the leaves should be clean, and they should be healthy. There should be no chemical in the soil, actually. This is how it should be. Thank you so much. Dry plants uh, and artificial plants not to be used. Not <laughs> <laughs> yes. Plastic plants will be the solution. No. Oh, they leave microplastic to your life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Barun, your final recommendation word. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tanmay, uh, once again. I'm going to do a shameful plug, but it's a very simple plug, How to Grow Fresh Air. It was a book written by my father-in-law, Mr. Kamal Mittal, and myself. Uh, and it's got a lot of very, very simple ideas and strategies and tactics of what one can do in their homes. And what Dr. Nilima said, I think a lot of that is covered in this book in terms of reducing your clutter and everything else. A couple of other things I'd like to add that perhaps have been missed out is in terms of nail polish remover, it produces toluene. So when you use a nail polish remover, go to the washroom and do it and keep your exhaust fan on so that the fumes from the nail polish remover go out of the house rather than linger on and you keep breathing that toluene. 
Uh, in terms of the exhaust fan for the kitchen, of course, you've got to keep them on and create the negative pressure within that kitchen space so that the paratha smell isn't in the entire house, but just goes out of the kitchen directly. Uh, gas stoves, you know, a lot of cooking questions did come up earlier. One of the key things that we got to re re realize is that the fuel that we use for our cooking, i.e. a cylinder or a gas cylinder, if the stove is not right, i.e. if a yellow flame is coming out, that means combustion is not happening correctly and more particulates will come out because of that. Whereas a blue flame is the right flame color to have, which reduces, it doesn't eliminate it, but it reduces the emissions of particulates and harmful gases. So ensure that your stove is giving out completely a blue flame versus even a slight hint of a yellow, even a dot of a yellow in, in the flame is not a good thing. So there are a couple, these are simple things and there are many more in the book. However, the one thing I want to really end with is the awareness piece. You know, people only think of indoor air quality in the winter months. They actually pack up the air purifiers and put them away just like the heaters in the summer and monsoons. And we have clients who do that, even after telling them and explaining to them that even in the summer, even in the monsoon, when it is 50 AQI or 60 AQI, if you can use your air, air purifier and bring it down to zero, it actually helps you. It actually makes you healthier. So there are not only short-term repercussions to indoor air quality because we are spending 80, 90% of our time indoors, but there are long-term impacts. It's not just about our lungs. It's not just about the health in terms of our respiratory health, but this air pollution actually, because it is so small, it is invisible, it goes into many other organs of the human body. Today, we are seeing cardiac issues, stroke, kidney failure, liver failure because of air pollution. Pregnant women have been researched to find particulate matter and other pollutants in the placenta and birth weight of children is reducing because of that exposure to pollution. So the awareness around this topic is so critical and important that people need to understand that this is a year-long phenomena, not just in India, but globally. And we all need to take ownership of our health in our hands and do something about this. Thank you. I think you've ended it with a perfect understanding because we know countries that have struggled with pollution outdoors, taken years to fix it, are now still facing drastic, dire consequences of poor indoor air quality. And there's a lot of focus now on health and indoor air quality, even in places where the pollution levels are low. We must uh, take this in a, in a way that it, we don't have to come back and address this later. We are addressing all our challenges with pollution. There's uh, so much happening in the country. At the same time, indoor air quality also needs maybe even more focus than that. And we'll come back to all of you for, uh, for, for the sessions. Thank you for absolutely- uh, Mr. Barun should give us uh, his book, all the panelists a uh, copy of his book. Yes, we'll get it. We'll yeah, have Tanmay, to plan it. Tanmay, 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 you have to do that. Done. We'll, we'll make that book available. We'll also share the link of how to get it for all our participants. Yes. And we just definitely, as an outcome of this, need to make these, you know, top 20 things that one must do, which is, which can be put on social media or whatever way we communicate to take this thing further. Thank you. We've definitely overshot our time. Uh, we could have gone on for another hour uh, and still not run out of questions. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Dipanjali. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for an eye-opening discussion on the sources of indoor air pollution, ongoing studies, best practices, and initiatives shaping the narrative around indoor air quality. Once again, thank you to our incredible panelists, and a big thank you to our audience for being a part of this Breathe in Dialogue. Um, this was an enriching discussion, and we all have some fruitful thought uh, food for thought and actions, and reminding that small changes can lead to significant uh, improvements. With that, we bring our webinar to a close. Um, until next time, have a wonderful day, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>